Hi, it's been over two months since I had my TERP surgery and I've been at home recovering. So I thought it was time to produce another video. Uh, I've done two other videos. One was called catheters, uh, living with catheters, BPH and UTIs. And then the second video was about the TERP surgery itself and what happens in hospital step by step. So I thought it was time to do a third video of how my recovery has been going now that I've had the surgery and I'm back at home. And yeah, um, I'll cut to the chase now. I'm, I'm actually come good now. So a lot of the pain's gone away and uh, the bleeding and what have you. But it is a bit of a journey. And while I was experiencing the recovery, um, I told myself a mental note when, if you do another video don't try and sugarcoat it tell them yes there'll be pain and there'll be days where you get down but now I'm at the two and a half months mark ten weeks uh, I'm, I'm feeling great I'm almost back to normal so don't let it get you down during the recovery process there is light at the end of the tunnel so you can see here, I've, I've done my <laughs> a bit of a journey uh, living with catheters, self-catheterizing, UTIs, pain, emergency visits to the hospital. And then finally I, I had my surgery and then it's back at home, uh, blood in the urine, not being able to sit down, blood clots coming out and not being able to work. And then finally getting better and better to the point where now I can actually get out and move around in the garden and even go for walks and I think now I can try and get back some of my fitness that I've lost over the last six months of this BPH journey so yes it, it takes time to recover so let's go into the details and the first thing I'd like to cover is what actually happened. I'll just go over again about what happened during the surgery, because this explains why you're having blood bleeding and you're having pain. So here we have a, a normal prostrate and, and then on the side here, we've got an enlarged prostrate. And during surgery, they inserted a, a, a scope and there's a, a wire here and that scoops out the inner layer of your prostrate to widen it up so that you can urinate again. And normally, uh, doing a TERP surgery, they'll widen it up and it'll look something like this, where they've taken out all the inner layer of the tissue. In my case, the, the prostrate was quite large, so they only took out one side, leaving uh, some of the inner, inner layers of the prostrate gland um, in place. So that's why you've got pain. Uh, this, this inner layer of tissue has been removed and it takes time to heal up and form a, a, a lining so, so that you, you don't feel as much pain and, and you won't bleed as much. When you urinate, it's like urinating for an open wound. So the urine is quite acidic and yeah, it'll burn and sting and there'll be blood at the start of your urination when you go to the toilet and it'll take time for that to heal up. Now the, the, the outer layer of the prostrate is where most of the nerves are and those nerves are responsible for ejaculation and uh, erections. So the good thing about TERP is it's just removing the inner layer and hopefully none of those nerves will be affected. But after you've had your surgery, of course, um, you'll find out if, if you've got some minor damage to your nerves or not, but most men don't have nerve damage. If you've had cancer, that's a different matter because the cancer could be in this outer layer here and some of the nerves may be affected by the surgery. But for uh, BPH, they're just removing this inner layer and staying away from these nerve bundles along the side. But 
one of the issues with removing this tissue is that that inner layer has got lots of tubes and it's it produces the white milky substance that you see during a eject during ejaculation so the prostrate will will squeeze and that milky fluid will come out and then take the semen out when you, when you ejaculate so if if you've taken out that inner tissue you will probably not produce as much milky fluid as you did before and you may experience a um, dry ejaculation so nothing will come out you still have an orgasm but nothing comes out and some men given enough time may recover some of that function so that's something you need to see you know are you do you have a dry ejaculation after the surgery oh, but give yourself time to recover so during the healing process uh, the, you may still have issues where uh, at the bottom here there's a bit of scar tissue or at the top you may build up scar tissue and that may block the flow of urination so you may have to go back in for a second terp but 90 percent of terp surgery is successful okay let's talk about blood and clots in the urine and how long it takes so uh, it took me four and a half weeks before the blood i could say that the blood had cleared up in my urine and so it was quite red at the start and it would clear up and the more i urinated the more clearer the the urine, urine appeared but if if i didn't drink enough and i just peed out a little i noticed that the, the initial flow was quite red and then what came after it was clear but if i drank a, a lot then it would look like i didn't have any blood at all so it was difficult to know if i had stopped bleeding or not because if I didn't drink enough, it was red again. If I drank a lot, it didn't appear as if there was any blood at all. And I was, depending on what I was doing during the day, if I was moving around, I could find that the blood would come back. And if I took it easy, the blood sort of cleared up. If I took a couple of days of taking it easy. So down the bottom here are some of the blood clots that I found in my urine. And it depended on the day. So I may not have any blood clots or blood in my urine and it looked like it had cleared it up and then four days later it would come back again because I had sat down too much or I had moved around or I tried to drive or something could set it off again. So here's some of the shots and some of the blood clots can get quite large. In extreme cases they can actually block up your bladder and and uh, you may have to go into emergency because you go into retention when you urinate you'll find that th there'll be still stinging and burning sensations and they even after you've urinated they can persist for up to half an hour after you've urinated and to address that i would take something like urinal which would uh which is quite alkaline so the acidic nature of the of the urine would be lowered it wouldn't be as uncomfortable when you urinate the second thing i'd do is i'd try and drink as much water during the day as possible because the more i drank the more diluted the urine would be and the less pain i would have but i even with that that i still noticed that initially if I urinated, I'd have a lingering, stinging, burning sensation for a while. And, but those two methods did help, but not completely. About the two week mark, I, I noticed that my pain was getting worse. Uh, after my surgery, I had been given antibiotics. And it was a five day course. And I finished that course when I got home and I was feeling good. Uh, my initial urination was fantastic. I, I could fill up a, a cup of urine in, in no time at all. So I was absolutely elated with, with the progress. And I, eventually I stopped the antibiotics and the pain was okay. It wasn't off the charts. 
and I thought I was progressing well. But around about the two week mark, my pain was getting worse and it was getting worse and the burning sensation was coming back and the stinging and after urination, it was quite painful and I'd have to it'd be about an hour before it settled down. And I was dreading going to the toilet again because that pain would be back. So it was going up to 11 and I realized that the UTIs, the infections that I had in the past had reoccurred and I had another infection. Now th this is quite common when you've had catheters. I, I had multiple catheters and um, with catheters you get UTIs and once you've had a UTI it's not uncommon to have it again and again and again. So I went back to my family doctor and he gave me some strong antibiotics, a 10 day course to deal with the uh, infection that I had. I had the results of my previous antibiotics where they had worked out what I had built up resistance to. So I had resistance to a particular type of antibiotic. So I, I got a different antibiotic and it was quite a st strong dose. So I started that 10 day course and it did take the pain or well, lowered the pain wasn't completely gone but it was manageable I, I could get through the day but it was uncomfortable and to deal with the pain uh, normally I take something like paracetamol to take the edge off but paracetamol can be quite can damage your kidneys and taking it every day is something I, I didn't want to do so I looked into getting hemp oil and hemp oil is now legal in Australia well it's illegal it's legal in my state and there are virtually no side effects to taking that so I, I bought some to deal with the pain and to be able to sleep at night and it worked fantastic I if I take that before sleeping I would have no problem sleeping and it took the edge off the pain so I'm glad I did that you don't get high on the stuff it, it's got the active ingredients of CB1 and CB2 so that's what I did for managing the pain especially when I had this infection but after 10 days uh, as I was coming to the end of that 10 day course of antibiotics I realized that the infection had not gone away and I was getting desperate if the infection I'm taking antibiotics and the infection's still there and it's been almost 10 days I'm gonna to have to go back to the doctor and tell him that hey I've still got the infection and he, and based on my research what they generally do is keep you on the antibiotics for th two to three months until it clears up and the antibiotics infected my digestion it made me sleepy it made me drowsy I just didn't feel good on antibiotics but I I had no other choice I'd have to go back to the doctor and get another course of antibiotics and that's when I remembered that in the past I had investigated corroidal silver and I actually bought a machine so I could make my own uh, ionic silver which is silver nanoparticles and the, the reason I had done that in the past many many years ago was because I had learned that it had antibacterial properties antifungal antivirus properties as well and when I had tried it I was healthy at the time so I didn't mu notice much of a difference because I, I didn't really have any health issues to start with so after a few months I just put it in the cupboard and forgotten about it and I remembered that I had done this in the past and I thought let's try it again I, I renewed my research into it and there's over 600 different bacteria that uh, corridor silver can take out so it acts by attacking the wall of the bacteria and also interfering with the life cycle of the bacteria so I was had pain I tried it in the morning I made myself some some ionic silver and I drank it just a little bit and that day almost immediately my pain subsided and I was still taking the antibiotics but they weren't working but as soon as I started taking the, the silver it, it worked and my pain dropped off 
And so I've continued that ever since so that the infections don't come back. On the first day, it started working. The next day, even better the next day. And then I felt, okay, it's already dealt with the infection and I don't know to need to go back for more antibiotics. So I was ecstatic with that outcome. And uh, yeah, so no infections since then. And I just take a little bit of coronal silver or ironing silver since. If you're curious about what the difference between coronal silver and ironing silver is, the coronal silver is more bio, bio available. Whereas if you, if you buy a machine, which is a lot cheaper, make it yourself, it's ironic silver. So pretty much the same thing. But if you go to a chemist and buy coronal silver, it's going to be quite expensive. So I'd recommend just getting a machine and making it yourself. But an uh, amazing outcome there. And I'm now confident that I, I probably never need to take another antibiotic again. And yeah. And uh, I, during the research, I, I read some research papers about it, about uh, some of the other areas of effect, and it even blocks um, spike proteins binding to cells. So that's another plus when you're looking at it. Okay, so that's my experience with a <laughs> infection at the two week mark. And uh, yeah, 10 days of antibiotics, but it's the coronal silver that, that, that took out the infection in the end. All right, let's talk about taking it easy and not straining yourself. The surgery, the lead up to the surgery, I had been through a lot. So I had been in retention multiple times and been distressed while waiting for a catheter. I had so, so many issues with retention that I had to self catheterize myself and I was bleeding, I was having a lot of pain, and then I was getting UTIs and infections, so the pain was getting even louder and louder. And then the last two months I had a permanent catheter, uh, and this all took a toll on me. So I just mentally was saying, if I could just get my terp surgery and get the surgery done, I'll be free from this nightmare and everything could be good. So I felt like I was in a marathon. If I could just get my surgery done, everything could be good. So yeah, I got my surgery. I came home. I saw fantastic results. My, my urine flow was fantastic. I was elated with the outcome. But then after that, it all hit me like all at once. I just felt mentally and physically exhausted. And it's like all that trauma that my body had, had suddenly come and hit me. And also the, the stress I'd been under with the pain for six months straight, endless pain, stress from work, just everything was catching up with me at once. So when I hit the couch, I felt like I just wanted to sit on the couch, sleep, and do nothing and not do I, I couldn't work I, I couldn't handle anything so the point I'm making here is probably after surgery you might have to take it easy for quite a while and uh, that's what, what was happening with me uh, the I found that I was a little bit anemic uh, my blood results showed that my hemoglobin levels were quite low I think it was because for months on end I had been bleeding. So that weakened me as well. I took some iron tablets to try and recover that. But yeah, my fitness had dropped off. I was feeling anemic. I had low blood pressure. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to sit on the couch and do nothing. So if you've got expectations that you're going to get back to work, um, maybe you'll experience something similar to me. In, in retrospect, it's probably a good thing because you really don't need to be, you don't want to be moving around too early. So um, if I wasn't on the couch and if I sat up, the bleeding would get worse. So if I sat at the kitchen table upright, that hurt and the bleeding would get worse. If I tried to drive on the steering wheel, if you're turning, I felt that stressed tugged on my prostrate and I could feel that, oh, that's not good. 
like most men you probably want to get back to a normal lifestyle as quickly as possible but each time I I tried something I got reminded that no it's still too early so four and a half weeks it stopped it took for the blood to stop now each person will be different but in my case it was four and a half weeks and I thought it's all good now I can go back and and maybe go for a walk and after the walk I'd find the blood was back and then I'd wait a few days and it would clear up and then I thought oh good I'll, I'll actually go for I might try some light tennis and after that there'd be lots of blood so yeah even after four weeks I had to take it easy the blood had stopped but I, I couldn't really just go back to a normal life and activity as regards to your partner if if you've got blood and you've got pain don't even think about it you, you're not going to enjoy it so give yourself time to recover now, knowing men um, you'll probably ignore their advice and try it anyway and you'll have to find out for yourself that yeah it's better to wait my my surgeon had booked a uh, a follow-up appointment two months after my surgery so at, at the two month mark I went went in to see him and the I had to drink as, as much water as I, as I could because uh, they were going to do a flow test on me so before I went in to see the surgeon I went into the toilet and I you what you, what you do with this machine here is you just pee into that that bucket area there uh, so you press the start button you start peeing and it'll measure your flow and calculate the the maximum flow and the average flow a readout will come out the top and I gave that to my surgeon you can see my 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 maximum flow was 30 milliliters per second which is very good because uh, normal flow is greater than 15 millisec milliliters per second if you're under 10 well then uh, that's not good but you can see from the chart here I had a good result from my flow test and the surgeon did a ultrasound to see how much was left in my bladder there was a little bit left in my bladder I, I guess there was a bit of time between peeing and him seeing me there was 80 mil left in there but I wasn't too concerned about it he he said that's okay um, it's not too concerning I would have I would have preferred I thought I was going to have zero left in my bladder but um, as I said I drank a lot of water and I don't have discomfort and, and a feeling like I'm I've still got something left inside me after I urinate so um, I'm quite happy with the results he did tell me that in the future if I've noticed difference a difference in my urination and the flow was were getting more restrictive that I should come back and see him and then he would monitor the situation and see if I needed a follow-up to because you, you can have obstructions um, when you heal up you can have scarring and and that scarring can block the flow 90% of cases men have successful outcomes for a turf surgery and that can last you 10 to 15 years and before you have it uh, grow it back on and start to have issues again so uh, yeah I'll talk about diet in a moment which is one of the things that you can do to make sure that you don't grow back your prostrate and um, have to go in for a second term so yeah that was a good outcome for my uh, follow-up appointment so I was happy uh, I still had pain and um, stinging but after addressing the UTI it was nowhere near the pain levels that I had before okay so let's talk about rebuilding your immune system so you've come out of hospital you've had surgery and you've also had antibiotics and once I finished the antibiotics I, I looked at taking a, a probiotic and so I went to the chemist and I got myself a good quality probiotic so that I could repopulate the bacteria in my gut to get my digestion back to normal so that's something that you should look at you have prebiotics and probiotics so that if you get a mix of the two 
uh, the prebiotics like food for the probiotic. And because the probiotics got to get through your digestion system, which is quite acidic, and most of it dies off. Um, so for that reason, I, I got 50 billion uh, level of probiotic. So it had some chance that some of that, those, uh, that probiotic would get through to my lower gut and repopulate the bacteria. The prostrate uses a lot of zinc and to, to, for a healthy prostrate you need zinc. So I, I took taking zinc and but your body has a bit of trouble absorbing zinc by itself. So I, in combination with that I take vitamin D. So the D helps your body utilize the zinc and I would take uh, vitamin C because you know, C is good for you as well. Now you can get ascorbic acid vitamin C, but ascorbic acid is just one part of the, the vitamin C complex. And so it's not going to help you much if you take the cheap vitamin C that's ascorbic acid. So I got a, a good quality vitamin C. And um, also to repopulate my gut with good bacteria, I I got back into the habit of taking apple cider vinegar, organic apple cider vinegar with um, just a like a tea, tablespoon in water each morning. The first thing I do in the morning and uh, that that helps repopulate your gut bacteria and also it's very healthy to do that as well. Um, so I've been doing that for years and uh, it was it really helped address some of the health issues I had with allergies and yeah, mainly allergies. So they helped me no end. Uh, when I came out of hospital, I did mention in my previous video, I still was constipated because I was taking antibiotics, I had surgery. And so I got myself some natural lax laxatives and I was taking them after, during, while I was in the hospital and when I left hospital. And after a few days, I was able to go to the toilet again. I thought I might have to get some animals to get things flowing again, but these softeners really did help. Yeah, I didn't want to get constipated. If I had, if I was straining any way at all, the blood would get worse um, during urination and you would experience a little bit of pain. I, I don't take the, the softeners at all now. Um, I feel like my digestion has recovered and I've actually finished my my uh, probiotics. So I feel like my gut health has really returned. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, one of the other things I've been doing is been taking baths. So before surgery, I, I had catheters and the only thing I couldn't take baths, I, I could only take a shower. I missed having my baths. And what I would do is I would have a bath and I'd put Epsom salts in the bath and also bicarb soda and that would be a, a like a natural detox. So before my surgery um, at night I used to have trouble going to the toilet but if I had my Epsom salts and bicarb so, soda bath uh, I, I found that I could get through the night a lot easier. And so, so I had been doing that for five years. And so I, I basically put off having the surgery because I wanted to try other methods to deal with that. So one of the methods that I used was having these um, detox baths and they helped a lot. And so now I've had my surgery and I think around about the week mark, I decided to start taking baths again. And so I'm really enjoying that and I'm sleeping very well at night. So the, the, the baths basically dry out a lot of the toxins and that that you build up over time. A good thing to do. But more importantly, what you eat and your habits affect your health. And this, this is something that I discovered five years ago. So I was putting on weight. So I went from 75 kilos up to 101 kilos and I was, I was getting big. I was getting aches and pains. I was feeling like if I had a meal that afterwards I'd get hungry again. I'd have to have a sleep and then I'd have to have something sweet just to try and 
get through the day and I didn't realize but I was building up insulin resistance and once I reached 101 kilos and su suffering from all these aches and pains and not being able to sleep well I decided enough was enough and I needed to educate myself about my health and what I was eating and why I was ending up like this and so I started studying and I realized that I was building up insulin resistance and when you build up insulin resistance what will happen is you'll you'll get bigger um, your metabolism will change and from the research I've done you'll also start growing your prostate and there's lots of theories about why the prostate gets older bigger as you get older but from my research insulin resistance is one of the primary causes of large prostate um, so doing my studies I, I realized that's important I've got to start dealing with insulin resistance and so I would chip away at it I'd try out different things so I'd, I'd start to remove some of the sweet things in my diet but the major thing I did was I realized that if I got rid of carbs because carbs can raise your insulin levels higher than sugar or an, uh, a snack bar if I could get rid of carbs like bread then I can start controlling my insulin levels well so I started off with removing bread then I got rid of rice and each step of the way I found that my cravings subsided I didn't have this oh I've got to eat now I've got to eat all during the day and late at night just to deal with the cravings so I was quite surprised that my energy levels stabilized and I didn't have these cravings so removing the carbs the first step to controlling my health in addition to that I stopped drinking alcohol because uh, alcohol basically goes through the same similar process to um, sugar so it, your liver needs to deal with it almost in the exact same way as um, sugar and so yeah alcohol was removed from my diet I'd still have the occasional drink or a beer the word there is occasionally when I was before my surgery what I found was that while removing carbs and uh, processed foods and bad oils from my diet my weight came down my health improved my allergies went away the aches and pains went away as well so my, my health became really good and the issues I had with urination also improved but my prostate was already enlarged so yeah it, it didn't make my prostate shrink at all but I, I could manage the symptoms of having a um, enlarged prostate far better and that's probably why I lasted five years without surgery the moment I went off my my no carbs eat healthy diet the moment I did went off that like I'd go have drinks with friends and yeah I, I would go into retention have to go to emergency all right so don't drink anymore be very careful so then I'd be fine and then I'd be invited to eat with friends and yes I would go out and I'd order things that I normally wouldn't be eating so I'd have you know carb full like dirty carbs like spaghetti or noodles and maybe I'd have a beer and sure enough again I would go into retention so the prostate was almost like a, my barometer telling me if you eat things that your body is going to have difficulty with you're going to have trouble so that prostate was like telling me what was good for my body and what wasn't yeah so that's what pushed me over the, the edge in the end I, I went off my diet and I went out for meals and uh, yeah if, if I had bread and spaghetti and especially carbs I feel like my tummy would be upset and uh, I'll put the links in the bottom of this video uh, of, of some of the research that I've read about um, the effects of um, especially wheat based products so that you can uh, motivate yourself to change your diet and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if you don't change your diet and you've got bad eating habits what's going to happen 
your prostrate's going to become an issue again in a few years and you're going to have to go back in and do another terp surgery and that's not fun the more surgery you have the more chance that you're going to have nerve damage and erectile dysfunction and all the rest of it it's a possibility so i, I use my problems with bph to motivate myself to change my habits and to change and believe me changing your eating habits is one of the most challenging things you can do in your life but now i've changed my habits i'm sitting around 80 kilos so down from my 101 down to 80 no, in fact today i was 78 so I'm, but if i'm at 80 kilos i'm happy interesting enough when you eat healthy uh, you stay off the carbs uh, i eat as much meat i my breakfast is um, meat fish eggs broccoli avocado things like that no carbs and i eat as much as i can so i'm not starving myself um, if if you go on the, the so-called modern diets you'll find that they're, they're talking about low fat and you know eating salads and watching your calories none of that works so I eat meat, I eat eggs, I don't cut off the fat, I eat lots of vegetables, I stay off the carbs and try and stay away from sweets. I, I do weaken every now and then but um, yeah when if you get back onto the sweets bandwagon or carbs it's it's very addictive. I found that over the last six months I haven't done any exercise at all because of my condition and I've maintained my weight and I eat as much as I like. I do do the keto diet so I try to restrict my eating from 10 a.m. to about 3 p.m. so that um, I eat as much as I like from 3 p.m. to around about 10 a.m. the next morning I'm not eating at all and that gives my body time to lower the insulin levels which is what you want so um, but if you're working maybe that's not possible for you but you you need to look at your diet make changes where you can because if you just continue the same habits you you'll probably find yourself back in the same position again so that's some life advice uh, um, on the subject of oils uh, which i forgot to mention try and remove seed oils from your diet that's the corona oil all these seed based oils they're highly processed a lot of omega-6s in them and they'll mess with your um, system as well so in, instead of that you have something like olive oil coconut oil butter but say stay, stay away from the seed oils so they, they do mess around with your um, body quite a bit and cause inflam inflammation all right so let's move on from health um, the other thing I do is I, when I was looking at my health was I started researching uh, medicinal herbs and mushrooms and I discovered a whole world out there that I didn't know about. So um, I tried out different things and my modus operandi is I've, from a couple of months I'd try something in isolation and if it didn't work I would go on to something else. So I, I just don't read about this I, I try it out in my life and if I could notice a difference then I kept it for my work I drank a lot of coffee with BPH you really shouldn't be drinking that much coffee but I needed it to get through the day so uh, what I would do with my coffee I I would have turmeric with pepper so uh, pepper helps you absorb the turmeric and I'd have cinnamon cacao and and some occasion i put a bit of ginger in and i'd have that in my coffee now this mix here doesn't taste very nice it's quite bitter and and most probably most people wouldn't be able to stomach this combination but now i'm used to it i i quite enjoy it but the the turmeric and the cinnamon are the the two important ingredients here for your health the turmeric is all round build up your immune system and your resilience yeah turmeric has been taken for thousands of years 
and the cinnamon will help. It helps with bacteria, but it also helps with lowering your insulin levels. So that, that's why I have cinnamon basically all the time now. There are two types of cinnamon. One you can get in China and the other one's in a place like India and Sri Lanka. So the, the non-Chinese versions of um, cinnamon are the ones that you need to go for. Now, the medicinal mushrooms, um, the reason I got into that was because I was interested in reducing my prostrate size and I started researching medicinal mushrooms. Now, I didn't have much luck with reducing my prostrate size. Uh, Lee, she was meant to help, but mine was already so large that um, taking this helped me with my symptoms, but it didn't reduce my prostrate. But my overall health, though, improved with this. So uh, the second mix that I have when I'm with my coffee is ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is like a basic all-rounder. Usually comes from India, and yeah, if you research a bit on ashwagandha, you'll just see it's got a lot of research behind it, and yeah, it helps you with stress, it helps your immune system, it just generally overall lifts your mood as well and gives you energy. The other one I recommend is lion's mane. Uh, after taking lion, was once I started taking lion's mane, I realized, wow, this stuff's good. And um, it helped me focus and it would lift my mood. But it just generally very, it's it's not like coffee where you take coffee and you can your mind is sharper and you, you can concentrate. It's more subtle than that. But it improves your memory. And yeah, you, you feel like you can get through the day and do all your work. And you're at a, not like coffee where you, your concentration goes up and then it drops off. With Lion's Mane, you can keep your focus for longer. So I really enjoyed that. And for energy, if, if I would play sports in the morning and I hadn't had a meal, I'd have my Ashwagandha Lion's Mane and I'd put in cordyceps and I could go play tennis and the cordyceps would give me the energy to play for two hours without having anything at all. And then, of course, you've got chugga, um, turkey, turkey tail, and uh, I, occasionally I have pine pollen. That's to keep my testosterone levels up. And I stopped taking ordinary milk because, um, yeah, there's issues with digesting milk. So I've switched over to goat's milk. So, yeah, th that's what I have with my coffee and to just maintain my health. And uh, yeah, it's a whole world that I didn't know about. And now that I've been doing it for roughly four years, I, I, I do, it works, so I'm not gonna stop doing it. It can be quite expensive, but it's worth it. All right, so let, let's bring this to an end. Um, as usual, my videos are, end up being longer than I expected. The general message that I'm current, trying to get across here is that after you've had your surgery, you may have had apprehensions about, you know, is this surgery going to be successful and all the rest, but you'll get the surgery out of the way and you'll go home and you'll probably have expectations that ah, two or three weeks and I'll be back to normal and I can be driving and, and going back to work and maybe even go back to the gym and doing all those activities I used to do. You'll probably find that that's not going to happen. And it's going to take a lot longer to recover. So I'm at 10 weeks and I feel like I'm almost back to normal. When I urinate, there's a tiny little tinge there, but it's almost back to normal. But it's taken 10 weeks to get to that point. The bleeding stopped. But I do know that if I was to go back and play tennis or, or if I was to do some weights or anything like that, that I probably open up my prostate and it'll probably start bleeding again. So I've still got to be careful. But my initial expectation after surgery was, hey, three weeks and I'll be doing the things that I used to do. So uh, I was quite surprised that I had to adjust those uh, expectations. And the uh, 
other thing that hit me was that after my surgery, physically and mentally, I was exhausted. I'd been through so much, as I said, it felt like I'd run a marathon and it collapsed at the, the finish line because I thought, you know, if I just get my surgery, that would be it. Uh, I'd reached my goal, everything be good now, but it's taken two months to really get back to from this to this where I'm feeling my energy levels have come back and my voice has come back. You probably noticed in the previous video, I had almost lost my voice. Yeah, so uh, because my health is, I'm feeling good, I can urinate without pain. Uh, my fitness is starting to come back. And just overall, my, my attitude has come back and I'm more positive again. So during that period, I, I almost felt like I was somewhat depressed because, hey, I had my surgery. Things should all be better now, but I've still got pain. I've still got infections. I, I've still got bleeding. Why am I still dealing with this? So yeah, it, it can weigh heavily on you. Uh, probably everyone's going to be different, but this is what happened to, to me. My, my prostate was quite large and the surgeon only removed half of the lobe, but he did remove a lot of tissue. So normally it's about 20 milliliters of tissue that they'd remove in the prostate. In my case, it was 30. But uh, at the end of it, I can say that at this point that the surgery has been a success and I don't have erectile dysfunction. I don't have retrograde ejaculation. So that, that was some of the major concerns that I had. Now, if you've had both sides taken, maybe you'll have issues with retro, retrograde ejaculation or driving ejaculation, but um, each person will be different. But the main thing is that you're urinating well, you can go to sleep at night without getting up five times to, to pee. And uh, I'm training my bladder because I, I got into habits that have been urinating a lot um, during my experience with BPH. But now that I've had my surgery, I can now train my body to, to hey, you don't have to go every time you, you need to, you can actually hold it for longer. And after a time, you'll realize that the number of times that you urinate should become less and less. Yes, so that, that's a lot of information to convey, but you can get through this. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And if there are complications, it's probably only about 10% of surgeries that have complications and you probably go back for a follow-up TERP. But, um, the, the main points are you, you can get back to your normal life and it will take time to recover. And on top of that, if you start dealing with what got you to the place where you had a large prostate, maybe it's bad eating habits, it's drinking. Yeah, those two. If you start addressing your, your eating habits and your drinking habits, maybe you'll be able to avoid this situation in the future. Okay, so I'm wishing all of you guys the best for your future TERP surgeries and uh, a speedy recovery to everyone. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.